Hello, it's an honor to be here presenting you my research. I am Tiziana Jenny-Candusa, and I will talk to you about spatial temporal changes in landscape connectivity for coyotes in Toronto. This work was done with Andrew Chin, Connor Thompson, Brent Patterson, and Marisha Sekhota. Toronto, as in Greater Toronto Area, is the largest urban center in Canada, and a study site comprises the Toronto region and the urban portion of the Peel region, and they are both part of the Greater Toronto Area, and they contain 63% of all the inhabitants. From the map, you can see all the red that is developed land, and across the red, we have Green, green shades, shades of green. And these are all the habitat patches that we have in the study site. And you can see most of them are alongside ravines, which are the, the blue lines in our map. And the rest are scattered across the developed land. So you can already see from this land cover map that the, our study site is a highly fragmented urban matrix. Inside the habitat types, nonetheless, regardless of how fragmented the habitat is, we have many different types of mammals. These are just a few that we have captured with our camera traps. And in this presentation, we will focus on the coyotes. Besides human wildlife conflict, they are also very important ecologically. As apex predators, they control animal populations. They also disperse seeds. They disperse the seeds inside the animals that they eat, on their fur, and inside the and inside the fleshy fruits that they eat. They're not strictly carnivorous, they're opportunistic, their diet is opportunistic, and they will eat fruits if they see them. And when they eat them, they will disperse the seeds. They mostly along natural areas. Research shows that one scat of coyotes can contain up to a thousand seeds of fleshy fruits. And for some fleshy fruits, germination and growth rate can be increased. Some, some seeds that are even dispersed by animals can attach to coyotes for, for up to two days with high efficacy, especially when the coyotes are wet. So they can disperse many more seeds than we, even, we could even think of. So seed dispersers, they can spread invasive species, they can promote genetic diversity across green areas, and with the long distance movement they are known for, they can reduce spatial genetic structure of plant populations, which increase their overall fitness. We know they can disperse seeds, but can they move across the city? How permeable is the city to the movement? Tracking data shows that they can move for long distances in short time. This is just an animation I made from one of the coyotes that we have data for. And you can see already that he can cross the whole Toronto region in a few days, crossing between urban habitat types, like there was nothing in between. And between these habitats, we have the urban matrix, which is highly fragmented. And if you think about it, the great barrier, it should be like, we, we think always that it's a great barrier for the animals. So the question remains, how do we move across the city? Which areas or urban features provide this permeability? And does the permeability change in time, temporally, or with the life history traits of the coyotes? To understand this, we do a connectivity analysis. To run a connectivity analysis, the first step is to generate a cost surface map, also known as a resistance layer. Each cell within the cost surface map will have a value. This is a resistance value that will say how permeable the cell is to animal movement. To do this, you can use expert knowledge, but you can also do it mathematically using a habitat selection analysis, and that's exactly what we did. We used tracking data to understand how habitat components were selected in interaction with the non-habitat components, in our case, temporal and life history traits. In terms of tracking data, we used data collected by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in collaboration with the Toronto Wildlife Centre. We used 29 animals that you can see in the map, and the sampling period was between 2014 and 2021. Some are still being tracked, and the mean day sample per individual was around was 94, plus minus 134. That means one to two years per individual, some a little less. The fixed rate between the locations recorded was one hour and a half to three hours. The ha for habitat components, we disgregated urbanization into four components that might affect animal movement. Vegetation, population density, so the presence of people, built up percentage, so how many buildings are in the area since buildings are barriers, and linear features. And we categorized this based on traffic and human use. In terms of non-habitat components, temporally, we use day versus night, Climatic seasons, in our case, we were, we were concerned whether the, the different shelter the vegetation provides along the year would create a difference in landscape connectivity. And that's why we use winter versus summer, six month seasons, where we had bare vegetation versus dense vegetation. Then we have the behavioral seasons, which are dispersal, pop breeding, and, and dispersal, pop breeding, and breeding for coyotes. 
and individual life history, we used age, sex, and social states. And in this case, it was residents. They were residents if they were staying in a delimited area for more than three months or transients if they weren't. So after that, we selected our model. First, we ran all the habitat components, and we selected the best one. In our case, it was the one with all the habitat components included. And then to this case habitat model, we added the non-habitat components to see which of the non-habitat components was the strongest in explaining our variation. And in the end, day versus night was the strongest model. And we can see how during the night, vegetation and linear features are selected, while during the day, only vegetation, and the rest are less selected than during the night. With those coefficient estimates, we created our resistance layer. And here we have the resistance during the night versus the resistance during the day, and the resistance values are higher already than the date at this stage. However, with this resistance layer, we further run the actual connectivity analysis, which we use very good scape for, and we analyze connectivity between 10 forest patches across the study site. And in these patches, we have evidence of coyote. So hypothetically, we are running the scenario where a coyote would have to run between one patch and the other, and we are therefore seeing which area would be more permeable for this to happen, for this movement. Here are the maps that Circus Fair gave us. The difference between day and night, or night and day here because night is on the left, the difference between night and day is not as obvious as the resistance layer. So we're going to, first we're going to try to answer our questions. I want you to notice that the center is highly connected while the, while the edges, the patches on the edges are isolated. Now we're going to look at this into more detail to try to understand how the different features are affecting movement. The first feature that we want to see, that we see, uh, which is very obvious, is the main movement corridors are ravines. Ravines are outlined in black on the maps now, and you can see that they are mainly when there's a ravine between two patches, that is the preferred the preferred movement corridor. And this is very interesting and also expected because ravines are highly vegetated and they also have hiking trails along the ravines, so they create streamlined movement. So there is the possibility for coyotes to use this to move for long. For long, for long distances. The second movement corridors that are quite obvious are hydrolines and railways. These create a network of movement corridors across the study area. I'm going to show you here are these are hydrolines right here, the ones that are more that have higher connectivity, and then the the railways as well. Here you have one of the hydrolines. And you can see hydrolines are electricity lines that run over open open areas that are left wild or they have parks beneath. They are sometimes um, fragmented by by roads, but overall they are they are they are open habitat where no construction is allowed. And then we have railways. Railways have they cross over the urban matrix uninterrupted. They have vegetation along the sides and they are fenced and well protected to pre to prevent um, accidents. So these are two corridors that are potentially of high use for coyotes. Here's another perspective, so you see how this could be perfect for coyotes to move across the urban matrix. Now zooming in into the most connected patches, we can see the difference between day and night. So basically here we see high connectivity because there is a high network of railways, hydrolines, ramifications, ravine, vegetation is high here. But the difference of between day and night we see in residential areas. Because when in residential areas, human pressure when when people go to sleep, the human pressure is released and then the the space is available for, for animals to move. And our, our connectivity analysis reflects this quite nicely. So what's most interesting of this zooming in is the difference between nature rich residential areas and nature poor residential areas. Yes, the connectivity becomes the 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 landscape becomes more permeable during night in both residential areas, but the difference remains during day and during night. So we see how vegetation creates a big difference in terms of connectivity, even in residential areas where human pressure is present. When we look at the isolated patches, we notice an interesting thing. If we look at these two patches to the west of our of our map in Mississauga and Etobicoke, we see that the main connectivity, and this is consistent between day and night, the main connectivity between these two patches is dependent on railways and hydro lines. This one here that crosses between them. 
And that's when we when we look into the surrounding area, we see commercial areas, industrial areas, big parking lots, and very little vegetation. On the opposite side of the map, between these two patches, we see connectivity gets better overall. And if we zoom in into the areas, we see we find commercial, industrial areas, some residential areas over here, and vegetation is better across the area. To summarize, our analysis reveals that connectivity for coyotes in, in our study site in Toronto is dependent on ravines, hydrolines, railways, and nature-rich residential areas. And in terms of spatial temporal changes, day and night makes a big difference for residential areas. However, where there is lack of vegetation, not even the release of, of human pressure increases connectivity. But we see that no changes during day and night for commercial industrial areas. And I have to note here that we use residential population density. We should be using, ideally, the location for mobile devices, but this data is crazy expensive. But so if we included this data, we would probably see a difference in commercial industrial area, a difference between day and night. However, the data is not included, but we still see that in spite of the release of human pressure during the night, vegetation makes a big difference. So if I leave you with anything after this presentation is how can we improve connectivity in our cities, in your city? Vegetation makes a big difference. Front yard vegetation and roadside vegetation are a tiebreaker. So if there's anywhere where the city can influence um, the connectivity is by increasing vegetation in front yards. And this is something that the city can do. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the University of Toronto for hosting me and the German Research Foundation for funding my time as a researcher.